Okay, Shanae, we are at one o'clock. All righty, let's go. My favorite part of, of the Zoom is like watching all of the folks come in. So I got a little bit distracted doing that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to this virtual gathering, which is a kickoff and information session for DPLA's Digital Equity Project, Advancing Racial Justice in American Libraries. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Shawnee Vetmarine Willis, Director of Community Engagement here at DPLA. And I design projects at the intersection of race and gender inclusion, which create pathways for the participation of new grassroots partners who have traditionally been excluded from digital projects due to technical or financial capacity. You're likely here today after reading the press releases we shared earlier this month and last week about the project. We organized this info session to answer questions about the 36 month project and invite you to be in dialogue with us, to co-design with us as we shift practices within DPLA and hopefully throughout the field. So what exactly is a digital equity project? How were the strategy and program developed? We'll talk about the inspiration for the work and give context for our framing of the project so that you can see the big picture. We'll walk you through the timeline and our initial plans for a community of practice guided by a paid advisory board. We'll also talk about the subgrants that will be available for digital capacity building projects as part of the grant. And this will give you a better idea of how to be involved in the project. You'll get to meet the initial cohort of three existing partners that will jumpstart jump start the project in year one. And uh, you'll, you'll take this opportunity to hear all about these amazing community-based projects that will inform DPLA's equity, equity model. We wanna make sure that you have all the information you need to share with potential partners and other stakeholders. So there will be ample time to set aside to answer any questions you may have at the end. We'll be monitoring, monitoring, monitoring the chat for questions and invite you to ask questions at the end via the raise hand feature, or you can just hop on the mic. We also have a lot of questions still about the project and how it will evolve, and you'll hear, hear those throughout the info session as well. Uh, now I invite DPLA's Executive Director, John Bracken, to the mic to give us opening remarks. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Shane. Welcome, everyone. Um, you know, one, when in thinking about this, I, I guess I wanted to share something that we've talked about as a team the last few days, and, I, and I've talked with a lot of some of you and other folks, which is, you know, often this is a really difficult time to be optimistic about our country, about our world, and about our democracy. Um, and the, given recent events, and I guess the flip is, I feel like this work that we're going to be, you're going to be hearing about today and that we're going to be discussing today is really exciting and is an opportunity for us as a team. We feel really excited to get our hands in the work and, and be part of adding to good in the world. Um, the, the project you're going to begin to hear about and that hopefully you'll be involved with is core to who we are as an organization at DPLA. Um, our mission has been to and is to ensure equitable access to information in a digital age, um, starting with a strategy we developed three over three years ago. We've been intentional, and a lot several of you were in the room in, as we formatted that format of that to really thinking intentionally and structurally about systems of oppression, specifically white supremacy, and how our institutions and how our work should needs to be reconsidered and reorganized to be a force for liberation and for good in the world. Um, you know, we've, you know, and this is a really opportunity to build off of some of the statements we've made. Our board has really put a flag in the ground on the centrality of racial and social justice to our work. Um, and this is a new level for what we're doing that we hope we anticipate, I anticipate being learning lessons from this is gonna be part of everything we do at DPLA. This is not a project that's gonna sit over here on a shelf. This is really core to how we're rethinking our work overall. At the same time, with that large level of ambition, I think it, for me, at least, and I've been encouraging the team, we're approaching this in a spirit of humility. Um, we know that the type of work we're taking on takes time, right? I mean, it almost feels ridiculous. A wonderful grant we have is really to you know, build forces of liberation to take on systems of oppression and racism, white supremacy, within a three-year grant, right? And we know this is a decades-long struggle for ourselves as individuals, 
for society and for this field. And, and we approach it in that, in that spirit. We also know we're gonna make mistakes. Uh, we hope you'll be in dialogue with us and have come back and share with us the mistakes we make. And we're gonna be open and transparent and sharing out what we learned through this process. Um, and I guess the other bit related to that is, I want to acknowledge we're doing this work building off of conversations and modeling done by other folks outside our work, specifically black and brown women in particular that we've been building off of. And so I want to acknowledge that work and that legacy that we get to stand off of and be part of growing. Um, this is also a, you know, a shift for us in that we, in an experiment for us in modeling new types of distributing resources, which we want to learn from. So how can we, uh, these new models of funding and partnerships that you're going to be hearing about today, I hope we can learn from those. And, and we've already had conversations with some of you about ways we might be able to grow that. Um, so welcome, you know, thank you to, to Mellon Foundation for enabling this work. Thank to you to all of our partners for being part of this with us. Um, thank you to all the folks, such a great list of names as Shane suggested, it's great to see there's a chunk of kind of core DPLA fans that I recognize in here, and there are a bunch of new names that I don't recognize, which is fabulous. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the DPLA team that's put so much into this work that you get to hear from. You know, first and foremost, Shane, thank you for your leadership and bringing this together. This is a result, as you're going to hear, of several years worth of real work that you that she's been at the forefront of. Um, and so thank you for that and uh, welcome. Thank you, John. Um, we sincerely, we are sincerely appreciative of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation support of the Digital Equity Project. Uh, we're especially grateful that this $850,000 grant award empowers DPLA's work to strengthen collaborative and mutually beneficial partnerships through a community of practice. I wanna send a special thank you to uh, Chandra Marshall, who is a program associate, associate from the Mellon Foundation for being with us this afternoon. We see you in the Zoom, thanks for being here. As John uh, said in 2019, DPLA really embraced a new strategy that centered on three core values, our belief in the power of collaboration, an intense focus on equity and inclusion, and the potential for technology to positively transform the way libraries and archives work. As part of this journey, we've been exploring new ways of collaborating with partners to ensure that all of America's stories can be told. As part of that work in September, 2020, we launched collaboratively uh, created and curated Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection, which you all probably know so much about and have visit, visited and shared with your communities. That work was made possible through the support of Pivotal Ventures, um, an investment and incubation company created by Melinda Gates to advance social progress in the U.S. We were awarded those funds by Pivotal Ventures to support this collaborative digital collection focused on the roles and experiences of Black women in the women's suffrage movement and more broadly women's rights, voting rights, civil activism between the 1850s and 1960s, which we expanded all the way up until present day to include Black Lives Matter in the Me Too movement. This two-year project included collaborations at the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, Atlanta University Center, Robert W. Woodruff Library, Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture in Charleston, South Carolina, Tuskegee University, and the Research Center, I'm going to start Research Center at Tulane University, along with the Southern California Library. And funds were uh, regranted to support new digitization and, and metadata remediation as part of our new collection. Our experience uh, creating the collection and learning from our partners made us really keenly aware about the obstacles that must be overcome, as well as some solutions for how libraries and archives can move forward building collections that truly represent our nation, its people, and their stories. And then in spring 2020, um, we had a double whammy. The toll of the impact of COVID-19 on people of color became apparent, and then our nation faced a reckoning with systemic racism. Um, as, as we were doing this and thinking about building on Black women's suffrage, we began to seek funding and sketch out a concept that leveraged DPLA as a repository for sharing and contextualizing personal accounts related to these two movements. We want it to be a resource 
as well as the support for works that were already in progress rather than creating more work for our librarians and archivists who are stretched really thin. We were also thinking about the technology tools that could make personal archiving easier, as well as how to design more subgrants um, for collecting institutions to help them curate artifacts and you know, ultimately later harvest them on dp.la. In our early conversations with potential partners, we heard a resounding need to imagine how DPLA collaborates. We heard about the need for continued financial support to help scale work, the need for honorariums for participants to fund basic necessities um, prior to even getting to building digital capacity. Folks are trying to keep their doors open. We also discovered that many of our existing partners don't have their relationships and networks in place to collect the experience of Black, Latinx, Asian, or Indigenous people. And our experience working on the Black Women Suffrage Collection also revealed that care and stewardship of African American collections during this time uh, was really, you know, requiring of ongoing support and understanding our partners' personal brand width and their institutional capacity. So COVID-19 completely evolved how DPLA went about maintaining relationships with our network. There were unanticipated changes in budget, professional anxiety, um, realizations that DEI work requires so much pre-established interrelation and relationship building, and that there was a real opportunity presented by our country, you know, this focus on justice, equity, and care that required us all to step it up a bit and um, get to a different level of dedication to understand and address DPLA's members' needs. Like we were doing DEI work and thinking about how to do DEI work better, but recognizing that we're still at the, we need to do DEI work phase. And also, um, you know, thinking about how to design our work to include new partners who would uh, traditionally been excluded from projects like DPLA due to technical or financial capacity. So herein comes the Digital Equity Project, Advancing Racial Justice in American Libraries, which is a pretty big audacious goal that we have here. Almost like, you know, who does DPLA think that we are, that we are going to advance racial justice in American libraries? I think a probing question to ask is what do we know about projects in libraries like DPLA? We know that libraries should reflect the voices and experiences of all Americans, yet the stories of people of color and women are vastly underrepresented in American archives as a whole. And we saw that glaringly through our curation of the Black Women Suffrage Digital Collection. We know that historically the field has struggled to add professional diversity. In 2019, 83% of librarians identified as white and non-Hispanic. And we know that to, we need to develop collections with the input and collaboration communities served. And as a result of these two things being um, pervasive uh, offerings in libraries have been predominantly shaped by white preferences and prejudices and often fail to represent the rich diversity of our nation's communities. We also found that even the very algorithms used to search collections reflect the inherent biases of those who built them. It's hard to find information about um, underrepresented, under-resourced groups. So we think with our big aud audacious goal that if libraries are to fulfill our fundamental purpose as instruments of democracy and equity, that a radically different approach is needed and that libraries of the future must be built by and with individuals who look like, you know, those people whose stories are being told, Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous experts and community members. There are incredible institutions, large and small, activists, artists, uh, records, creators and collectors that have and are continuing to capture historical data about people of color telling their stories and bring more representative and truthful narratives to light with new media. Despite the challenges of the past two years, these groups have figured out how to keep their work going, mostly through the help of volunteers, despite lean and oftentimes non-existent budgets. The time is long overdue for community-based archival projects, including those led by organized groups such as individuals 
to receive the support they need to build their capacity, scale their work, and be compensated fairly for their efforts, including the pre-processing and arrangement work that is a prerequisite for digitization and participation in projects like DPLA. We believe that DPLA as a trusted library convener with a demonstrated commitment to equity can play a role in shifting the library and archival space towards greater inclusion of diverse stories and voices. And to do so, we must continue building DPLA's capacities for partnering with community-based and community-serving entities, examining DPLA's internal structures through an equity lens and considering what fundamental shifts may be needed. So here's how we're going to approach this work. First off, we approach the work with a recognition of our strengths, our weaknesses and limitations, as John pointed out. Over the last two years, DPLA member organizations have begun to make significant efforts to live into our collective commitments to inclusion, diversity, equity, access, and social justice. And if you visit our events and workshops page, you will see recordings of um, sessions that hubs like the Connecticut Digital Archive and DLG have done around hospitality and ensuring that language is accessible for partners. Um, you'll see changes to our metadata application profile to ensure that metadata is enriched and name, there's, there's more uh, fields for names and uh, more context about collections. So that's, that's work that we've done over the past two years. And as a part of that, the Digital Equity Project um, was inspired by partner work and also direct requests from the members of the DPLA Hub for support in developing partnerships with underrepresented and under-resourced community organizations. So first, DPLA will establish a 10-person paid advisory board of diverse library leaders and practitioners that will provide overall project guidance and help select digital capacity building grant partners to join our community of practice. Current DPLA network members will have access to guidelines and toolkits developed by the community of practice to help guide them in their outreach and partnership building efforts and the structure and organization of the community of practice projects will serve as models for the entire DPLA network. In line with our goal of centering this work on equity and ensuring that you know, we do better about uh, reaching diverse under-resourced groups that have typically been excluded, we will hire a consulting partner with deep expertise in community outreach, anti-racist and anti-bias practices and co coalition building to support us during the first year of the grant with convening the advisory board, designing and executing an open call process for subgrant proposals and co-designing and guiding the direction of the COP. And we have been already talking to a number of community design firms that uh, coordinate projects across the country that um, center the needs of communities and don't make assumptions about um, what larger institutions have to bring to the table. They're very much focused on um, resourcing and guiding the work of community of practices, community of communities, and you know, like leveraging the larger organizations, essentially opening their purses, opening their, their coffers, and providing more um, digital uh, capacity and support and letting the community, encouraging them to define what success and the products of a partnership ultimately are. We expect by the end of this year, December 22, 2022, we will have uh, established the advisory board, designed and released the call for proposals, and selected partners to receive digital capacity building grants beginning in January 2023. And when we think of the advisory board, we think of thought leaders in the cultural heritage field who, are, who have demonstrated um, work in coordinating communities, community archives projects and working with underrepresented groups. We'd also like to expand on um, partners in our network. And one example I, I hope to foster with uh, this project is a connection I have at Microsoft. And this connection um, coordinates a program that provides hardware and software 
to community-based groups. If we're thinking about capacity building and technical capacity, what better way to support communities as they build that than giving them you know, resources beyond subgrants. So those are the kinds of uh, people that we'd like to be on the advisory board, those who have experience um, with local community impact projects and fundraising and um, giving circles locally and at the national level. For us, it's not about moving slow or you know, moving too fast. We really wanna take the time that is appropriate to achieve the things that our partners need to achieve and best leverage you know, BPLA's network to, to do that. While laying uh, this groundwork, we also plan to jumpstart the project work in the community of practice by providing digital capacity building grants to an initial cohort of three existing partners with uh, projects ready to impl be implemented. DPLA's Recollection Wisconsin Hub, Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, and the Seattle Public Library. These partners will make up the community of practice during the first six months of the grant period, which are pretty much now to December, and will continue to participate in the community of practice for the duration of the grant. We think that kicking off the community of practice with this initial cohort will allow DPLA to test and refine our program elements, such as technical orientation for community of practice members to come. And prior, we want to do this prior to launching the full community of practice in January 2023. So like we have a baseline and we, we have start to have an understanding of what, what partners need. Um, this will also enable the initial cohort to offer feedback and guidance to the advisory board on the development of the subgranting program. You all have heard me say community of practice, community of practice. I keep repeating that phrase. Here is our definition of it. Um, it's really about removing DPLA from the center while leveraging the DPLA network and the resources for the benefit of other organizations and asking ourselves, how do we do that? The current DPLA network at its core essentially operates as a community of practice with the working groups, the advisory council, the network council. These are where you know, groups of, of library practitioners um, organize themselves to solve problems and create standard practices. We think that creating a formalized community of practice structure for the digital equity project is consistent with feedback from the network over the past year requesting support, but we, we don't want um, the community of practice like place to be, it, it, become, it to become a, a plate of warriors, unsafe space for um, our network to, you know, like listen in on what's going on. We want it to be collaborative. We want it to be a place that sub grantees through partner action, discover mutual support and connections, and that the, C, the, the community of practice COP will allow us to learn directly from them without that warriorism, um, how to build a more inclusive network and what's truly needed to sustain digital um, building, capacity building products over time. Um, though not required because we realize that sometimes participating in cohort pro pro programs are not the best use of partners' times and they really just need the money and we're fine with that. Um, we recognize that participation in the community practice will, for those who you know, are interested, will require time and effort going above and beyond what is required for project implementation and um, oftentimes lack of remuneration for these efforts can serve as a barrier to engagement. They're not useful and they're also not a good use of time. Therefore, um, we built into the grant that partners will receive in addition to their subgrant stipend, their subgrant award a stipend to compensate them for the contributions for up to two representatives. For example, if there's a program manager and a community ambassador or other contact who's participating in the project that wants to join the community of practice, um, stipends amounts will be uh, per representative per year of participation. Um, I want to also give a thank you to our advisory council for brainstorming and pointing us to the shared definition of the goals of the community of practice during our April 7th uh, brainstorming session during that regular meeting. 
So we've seen in brainstorming with the advisory council and really thinking through um, the facets of this program that equity requires intentional pauses of reflection. New needs will emerge, learn and adapt. So what you hear presented here is quite frankly a draft and we expect it to change as we learn new things. Now you'll hear from some members of our initial cohort of subgrant partners about how these relationship partnerships and projects came about and challenges they are excited to address in increasing the digital capacity of partners. So I'm going to go into our chat and see who is available. I believe Martha Yeslowich from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library is with us. Martha, will you jump on the mic? Sure, I'm happy to. Hey, Shanae. Hey, Martha. Um, so I am Martha Yeswich and I'm the Community Partnerships Manager at Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. And we were lucky enough to work with DPLA a couple of years ago on the Black Women's Suffrage Project, um, a initiative we had called Engage 2020 that was really around um, elevating the stories of Black women in civic life um, around Charlotte. And it was a wonderful experience. We were really proud of the work we did. And so we're thrilled to align again around a project called the Living Archives. And the Living Archives is a partnership between Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, Johnson C. Smith University, which is an HBCU, the Levine Museum of the New South, and the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. And what we are doing is collecting and archiving COVID-19 pandemic stories and experiences from the Charlotte Mecklenburg community with a focus on voices that have been historically excluded from documentary and archival work. Um, we were especially inspired by some of the conversations we had with Shawnee around equity and archives and really thinking about how we could create um, a, essentially a living history project that really brought those stories to the forefront. Um, so we're working on a three year initiative to gather, preserve and share local histories, um, stories, documents, visual imagery, memories, um, spoken word, music, just whatever our participants want to share um, about the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on Black, Hispanic, Asian, Indigenous, and other specific communities in Mecklenburg County. Um, we are acting as a convener, a partner, and a project guide, trying to leverage the community trust we have to bring residents into the project. So we're really going into communities, talking to um, you know, trusted leaders and saying, how, how can we help you tell your story? And that's why when I talk about the story, I'm saying, well, it might be an interview. It might be a spoken word piece. We really want people to express their experience, um, their, their lived experience, share their experience in a way that resonates with them. And so we're really excited that DPLA has brought us um, into the subgrant because it will allow us to create um, a more robust, interactive, um, accessible web presence that will allow our community now and future generations to um, access and interact with these stories. So we're really excited. Thanks, Shawnee. Thank you, Martha. I'm really excited about the project too, to partner again with Charlotte Mecklenburg, who is doing such amazing work, meeting the needs of the community and, and doing this from a, from a different angle, a different, more expansive um, subject area. I'm now looking for uh, representatives from Recollection Wisconsin and the partnership with the Milwaukee Women's Arts Library. Uh, Derek Hi, this is Kristen. Hey, can... Kristen, thanks for being here. No problem. And if somebody else wants to jump in, that's great because I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> no worries. I'm looking for Derek. I don't see him, but I do have a blurb describing the project. If you'd like me to read that. That would be fantastic. Okay, will do. The Milwaukee uh, Women's Art Library began in 2018 as a grassroots project to develop a library and archive founded on the principles of solidarity, difference, and action with an aim to document and share the histories of women, 
non-binary artists, artists operating outside of global economic centers. In summer 2021, uh, the Milwaukee Women's Art Library made the decision to transfer an archive and um, to transfer their archive and their collective imperative to the archives at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Libraries in order to support long-term access and preservation. While the collection will benefit enormously from the institutional resources of University of uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee, it is still a growing collection that is rooted in a diverse and dispersed local community that is often not only unfamiliar with the university campus, but intimidated by its academic setting or simply the location and protocols. In order to bridge the gap between institutional support and grassroots community-led commu collecting building, um, this partnership will engage a community ambassador who is from and of the women in non-binary art community in Milwaukee. The community ambassador will work with the archives to build ties to the community and identify contributors to the collection. The community ambassador will benefit from training in traditional and digital archive procedures. And at the same time, the archives will engage the community ambassador to help identify and change practices and policies that unnecessarily create bias to access and use for the very communities that the collection documents. This will be a paid part-time position. And the project timeline for this partnership is October 2022 to September 2023. We are really um, grateful about how this particular partnership uh, lends itself to providing direct professional development for someone who's coming out of the community, who is an ambassador, who's familiar with the work, and who will also uh, give really great uh, feedback and define new protocols for making the collection more accessible and removing those barriers that many communities find when it comes time to, you know, get on a university campus, pay for parking, locate the building, um, in some cases, present ID where it's necessary just to, just to uh, view the physical materials that their community has created. So, uh, we're very glad to partner with Recollection Wisconsin on that. And Kirsten, since you're here, can you tell us a bit about um, the Digital Archives Toolkit? Oh, sure. The Digital Readiness Toolkit. Yes, um, yes, you, yes. You all, everybody here can get a little giggle out of this. I got to meet um, Shanae and John for the first time in Washington, D.C. at the ALA conference a few weeks ago. And I carried around this printed version of our Digital Readiness Toolkit and made everybody look at it because we're so excited about it. Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about it. It's a comprehensive guide for um, small and under-resourced organizations to embark on digital uh, projects, digitization projects, digital curation projects. It's really, I describe it sort of as a love letter to um, small and under-resourced cultural heritage organizations. I'll put a link in the chat here in just a minute, but we've just released it from Recollection Wisconsin, and it's the result of, um, similar to um, this Advancing Racial Equity Project, um, several years of community of practice conversations, cohort conversations, um, rounds of feedback and testing and really listening to what cultural heritage practitioners need um, in their digital curation um, work and digitization work. So thanks for giving me the chance to talk about it just a little bit. It's fully available online, free to use. Please uh, share it widely. Um, and there's a great downloadable PDF for searching purposes as well. Thank you, Kirsten, for sharing that. What is what really um, struck me about the guide, the toolkit, is that it's organized um, to incentivize and celebrate incremental progress. Mm -hmm. The tool guide is organized in uh, bronze, silver, and gold. Is that right? Yep, yep, yeah. And we really wanted folks to know that wherever they're starting and wherever they're finishing or um, wherever they are in their progress is absolutely okay. Um, I think we all work with these small and under-resourced organizations that get really intimidated by the word metadata or they get really intimidated when they hear about having to buy a scanner. Um, and we really wanted to extend this positive, supportive, encouraging, um, environment and material and literature for folks
folks in that uh, type of situation in those organizations to know that this is these are doable things um, and that anything that they contribute to, you know, the historical record, um, either open or, you know, reserved for their own communities is is um, steps forward is positive progress. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I see that it's in the chat now. We are also uh, sharing it as part of DPLA's latest newsletter. So if you missed the link here, um, it'll be in the newsletter. Uh, please share it out with communities. And we're looking to build, to incorporate products like this, toolkits, resource guides that already exist in our network to assemble them as resources as a part of this project and also to create new ones. This is a great model partnership for us. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Elisa Murray from the Seattle Public Library to come in and say a word about the partnership between Seattle Public and Wanawari. Let's see. Okay, trying to put my video on. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Elisa Murray at the Seattle Public Library. I am actually with the communications office. So um, in the spirit of humility, definitely not the expert on this project, although I'm very excited about it. I'm here um, to represent Andrew Harbison, who's the Director of Library Programs and Services, and he's uh, out of the office this week, so he asked me to, to listen in and report back. Um, so uh, for this project, we will be partnering with Seattle arts organization, Wanawari, which is based in the Central District. It's Black-led, and the Central District, uh, for those not familiar with Seattle, is the historic um, center for Black and African-American folks in Seattle, and they create space for Black ownership, possibility, and belonging through art, historic preservation, and connection. Um, and I'm going to in the chat, just drop a link to Wanawari here, so you all can take a look at that. Um, so this particular project will support the continuation and development of Wanawari's Seattle Black Spatial Histories Institute. And this is just a really exciting project that trains community members in the techniques and best practices of oral history and Black memory work. So uh, this started in about two, 2021, and um, they trained a six-person cohort working with the faculty of Black oral historians from, from around the country to explore ethics, techniques, best, best practices, and dilemmas of oral history. And then the cohort then practiced their new skills by conducting oral history interviews with local community members on topics such as Black educators, Black barbers and beauticians, Black experiences on the Seattle waterfront, um, and they're continuing that work. The cohort members received compensation and a certificate of completion. And this is one way among many that Wanawari seeks to build collective power towards a future of Black ownership and belonging um, by rooting their work in Black resilience, creativity, and self-determination. And this uh, project will be uh, directed toward helping train and then archive the second cohort of this work. So the goals include increasing representation of Black experiences in Seattle's cultural and historical record, supporting ongoing community history work conducted by a Black-led organization and making Black oral history publicly accessible in ways that are ethical and accountable. And our particular role will really be to center and advance Wanawari's work of gathering local voices and stories and um, eventually incorporating them, these histories into our collections. Um, so there's been some staffing changes. We're actually uh, hiring someone right now in our special collections who I believe will be the lead on this project. For now, Andrew is the lead, You're working closely with Wanawari. And for the remainder of this year, we'll be defining project details, roles, and deliverables, and are just beginning the planning process. Um, and I don't have all the background on how this project came about, but we have partnered with Wanawari in the past. Um, we're excited to center and advance their amazing work um, and Andrew can probably share more or even Sh um, Shani on, on, on the background of it. Uh, and the link that I shared is specifically about that spatial histories project that, that Wanawari is leading. Thank you so much, Alexa. That was great. That was plenty. Um, <laughs> I want to pick up on the sharing certificates of completion. One of the things that we're have discussed with um, a design firm is 
what does it look like to co-design and shift practice, but also um, to have partners be credentialed as part of this? Like, um, what does it mean to co-design a tool for um, not only completion for the, the technical capacity part of the work, um, but what does it mean for for partners to come out on the other side of this with perhaps um, some kind of cred credential in doing uh, anti-racist community archives building? What if that's a, a facet of, um, of credentialing that we create as a, as a part of this? Um, so I, I really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, how this partnership will talk will teach us about giving you know tailored support, professional development, and um, crow branding training, and thinking about new design and, and our approach. So thank you for sharing that, Elisa. Love that. Thank you very much. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to bring them back to Andrew as well. Wonderful. Next, I will. Share a um, abbreviated timeline for the project. Again, this is open to interpretation and um, responsiveness to partners' bandwidths and changes. So this is um, high level preliminary, and it not only represents new work, but how we seek to broaden inclusion and address long standing barriers in the field. And because of this, um, we built intentional and slow relationship building into our pre-planning phase. We, um, including things like this, where we're having a kickoff to talk about the project. Uh, we designed this three-year project, which starts uh, now and goes until June, 2025, which seems so far away and three major phases. Um, our first year is, what we're thinking of is year one. Um, my first phase in year one is contact, convening partners and project development. That includes our pre-planning work, sharing out uh, what we're working on, securing a design consultant, um, providing tech orientations and technical assistance to subgrant partners, and in partnership with this consulting, inviting and confirming members of the advisory board, which like we shared, we wanted to include community, archives, activists, independent act, artists, activists, um, small place-based institutions, technologists, um, and development and funding folks. We're going to officially um, announce the project and launch it this, far, this fall. Um, and based on our partners' timelines that they've been provided and, and um, Andrew at Seattle Public already told me that we need to change some things around due to staff changes there. The initial digital capacity building grants will begin. And I'm really pleased that from what we learned on Black, of the Black Women's Suffrage Project, that we're recognizing that partners need funds immediately. So we'll be um, working with partners to give some grants up, up front rather than um, going through the onerous process of applications and such for our initial uh, cohort. We'll develop the digital capacity building and community practice subboards program, um, including refining the draft, issuing a call, which is where you all come in to share this with um, partners throughout your networks who would be interested in the funding and benefit from the community of practice. Uh, we'll have information sense, uh, sessions like these to answer questions. Um, we wanna select between four or five additional subgrant community partners and really negotiate and finalize our work agreements rather than like the MOU. We wanna make this more basic um, and doable for, for our partners and hold in consideration their you know, overall sustainability goals. Phase two, uh, which will begin next year, January and March, new partners will receive funding. We're calling that our exploration, expanding their community of practice. Um, we'll have, share write-ups, uh, takeaways and results from our what we learn as we invite new partners to the community of practice, 
develop community practice goals, an action plan, a charter, community expectations, a meeting schedule, and project outcomes. We'll share that during the virtual convenings we have planned throughout the duration of the grant. Um, implementation projects from Charlotte Mecklenburg, uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and Milwaukee Women's Art Library and Seattle Public Library will continue including their hiring uh, project managers and community ambassadors. Uh, we'll host another convening that summer, continue to collect feedback, continue to provide technical assistance as needed. All of this continuing through year two, reviewing our work, um, supporting partners, initial cohort partners as their grant concludes. And then in year three, we are um, intentionally scoping out a phase three reflection, revision, and revelation time, where we host a convening with an advisory board to work on program evaluation. Uh, hopefully, if you know, the world allows, we'll conduct virtual site visits with partners. We can also do this virtually. Um, we'll continue to, uh, to um, collect feedback from partners from the community of practice on their experience. But we plan to generalize and share our practices and findings and advocate for their use amongst hubs, um, explore and identify uh, additional partnerships for additional online training and workshops to increase the skills and capacities of those in our community of practice. And we wanna you know, invite those community of practice members and partners to discuss project outcomes and deliver presentations at our regular national conferences, inviting folks who are doing the work to join in, and take the mic and beat and lift up their voices. We'd also like to um, share this work as part of uh, DPLA events, perhaps Members Day or DPLA uh, Fest. So that is our plan for activities open to interpretation. 36 months is a long time. And we hope to you know, take the takeaways from year one to redesign for year two. We're doing digital equity like 2.0 in real time every year. So with all that being said, the success of the digital equity project relies on um, a diverse and robust group of partnerships. These kinds of relationships we realize are holistic and will take considerable time and financial resources to build in a way that's equitable. And we recognize that, you know, even though we spec this all out on our timeline, it may be difficult for us to predict in advance how long these relationships and projects will take to develop. Another thing that we're doing differently um, is building in flexibility for unprecedented events and expanding the, the definition of what unprecedented means. Um, because not having the budget expectations you thought you'd have from last year to one year is unprecedented for many organizations. Due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and related restrictions, as we developed and partnered with um, Black women suffrage funders and some grant partners, we approved no cost extensions. Extensions, we reverse, revised uh, work plan timelines and we pivoted to online platforms for outreach and programs. The Charlotte Mecklenburg Library took their very much in-person uh, schedule of events related to the, um, the census and voting and mapping communities to an online program called Engage 2020 that was a raving success. It was incredible. And much of that work can still be found on YouTube. Um, so for the Digital Equity Project, we want to continue the practice of being responsive to our partners' needs. And we will work and commit with you know, all of our funders and subgrant partners to extend timelines and update project outcomes as needed. And we're really grateful for uh, Mellon's support in doing that. And you all will see this uh, commitment is a part of our subgranting protocols. I've shared already that, you know, we plan to do convenings and include sharing outcomes as a part of regularly scheduled DPLA events. But as John said, we also wanna share our mistakes, um, our mess ups and telling that story of, you know, how we overcame or how we, how we learned something or how that encouraged us to do something different 
what expectations we're deconstructing in real time, how we continue to elevate, plan to elevate voices beyond this project and listen and design with them. And based on what they have to say, really take their recommendations to bear in how DPLA creates products, including curation and our larger uh, strategy. So that is the digital equity project. What questions do you have for, for us? Whether it's um, any of the partners who join the, join the conversation or any questions about timelines or projects in your, and partners in your community that you're already thinking about, what questions do you have for us? I see a question from Steph. Do you have a, bibli a bibliography which brought you to these concepts, particularly communities of practice or the definitions of success? For our definition of community of practice, um, we got that definition from um, the nonprofit network. Uh, and that was shared with us with, from one of our members of the advisory council. We don't have a bibliography um, for the project, that's something that we might create as a part of our, our project outcomes. Um, you know, like creating a, I don't wanna say white paper because that's, that's been done, but perhaps something more engagement, engaging and um, interactive uh, as a result of this. And the definitions of success, we have some um, ex expected intended outcomes that we included as a part of our proposal. Um, but we ultimately, you know, want to include the community of practice of def defining what those are. So we made them pretty broad, like building new relationships, um, understanding their needs and interests, creating a collaborative space for discussion and thought leadership. Um, one of our, our goals, you know, quite frankly, is position DPLA as an entry point into the cultural heritage field through exposure to professional learning opportunities. That's why we're really excited about um, the community ambassador role through um, the Milwaukee Women's Art Library. And um, we'd also like to like got, use this as a, a proof and a guide for regranting protocols. Um, we expect uh, to have between 10 and 12 community practice convenings, um, as many technical orientations as we can provide, starting off in you know, the first couple of years with three and four, seven to eight subgrants. Those are our, our outputs and the measures of success will all depend on partners' reactions and needs assessments throughout our work to do that. Okay, I'm looking for more questions. Could you share this PowerPoint? Absolutely. There will be a recording of this meeting on the DPLA events page, along with the link to um, the Google slide deck. I see a hand raised, Evan Knight. Evan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Well, congratulations on this wonderful grant. I love the presentation as well. Uh, I'm curious about um, the next phase. Uh, so the way you're subgranting, it will be three of three libraries. And then for the second phase, it might be four or five. Uh, are you looking for, I'm asking about this next group of four or five institutions. Are you looking for more community organizations that are not necessarily larger libraries that are pretty small or um, are other libraries included? Um, could you speak a little bit more about who, what sort of uh, uh, organization and institutions you're looking for in that second cohort? Sure, sure. Um, so the program will support um, 
altogether between seven and eight, we're looking for four to five new uh, community of, of practice participants after the first year. And we're open, really. Um, we, we, I don't want to say we like, but we're, we're testing how well um, partnerships with larger institutions are working, like, for example, Charlotte Mecklenburg developing a living archives project, Seattle Public Library partnering with a community based group or giving direct support to um, artists, activists, community archives, place based uh, museums. It's, we left, we're, we left how we wrote it into the proposal pretty broad. And I imagine that our call for proposals will be just as broad. Thank you. Um, I work, um, uh, I help do some library granting for at the state and federal level from uh, IMLS. Uh, and also my state also has um, uh, uh, a state historic records advisory board. So that's National Archives and HPRC funds yeah. and then grants to states formula as well. So I, I help in Massachusetts there too. Um, but then there's also other groups that I don't work with um, that I think might be really helpful in mass at least. I don't know if other states might be helpful here too, but our mass humanities is a 501c3, not government, but they get money from NEH and it grants to states formula as well. And they, in my opinion, uh, at least in my state might be really helpful in getting connecting to those sorts of groups that aren't libraries or aren't necessarily a historical society or archive. So uh, happy to help out if uh, Massachusetts can uh, make send a good contingent of applicants. But um, I also do want to be realistic to those as I advertise it that like four or five international scale might be pretty difficult to get. So um, I, just being realistic, I think, uh, I, would you say that that's fair? It might be pretty competitive. Uh, it might be competitive due to the fact that there's a limited pool of funds to work with. Um, we have funding designated for grants ranging from $5,000 to $20,000, recognizing that smaller pools of funds might be just as uh, you know, resourceful and relevant to partners who would potentially be looking at something like the uh, the digital readiness toolkit, and they might be at the, the bronze level, but that $5,000 helps them get further along in the project. So I'd say it's limited due only to our you know, funding capacity. And part of our work um, in you know, operating the digital equity project as a pilot is that um, we recognize that, you know, we, this is going to be a project sustainability um, issue now and in the future as this kind of work becomes core to DPLA's um, strategy. And that through projects like these, we'll have to you know, quantify the, core, the cost of new programs and more subgrants, as well as talk about you know, transparency and sustainability for our programming partners because 5,000 grant, dollar grant this year, there still be need for funding, and we want to um, develop more uh, prospects that could support DPLA's equity work going forward, so that we can build on this model. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to to connecting to to talk more about potential partners. Any more questions? I'm looking in the chat. Are you working, this question is from Jarrell. Thank you, Jarrell. Are you working with your program participants on strategies to acquire buy-in from their administrators, specifically larger institutions and smaller institutions with boards that have not historically prioritized efforts like these? That is a wonderful question. When we were um, developing the grant proposal with Seattle Public Library, we began to talk about um, project contingency and how, just for example, I'll get back to the, your question, but I'm you know, sharing a story um, as part of my answer, how um, sometimes staff changes and administrative changes affect um, pro projects progress and that 
the advocates who started on the project are no longer there, so they don't have interaction with those communities, and it's hard to advocate up through the you know chain of leadership to why projects should continue. And we talked about um, as part of a, pro a product for the digital equity project, creating a guide for folks who um, can share all of who, who designates who all of the key players in a project are essentially like coming out of the project management space, a project charter and how um, how documents and resources like these could be used to um, advocate and also educate members of their community and stakeholders who aren't familiar with these projects um, and, you know, instruct them and, and, and build coalitions with them by providing information so that they can be just as passionate and um, passionate and also be advocates for the continuation of work like these. So that is something that we've thought about. We've also um, had conversations with um, library collectives over the past two years as a part of our work, like how do we continue engagement? How do we, um, how do we create more funding sources for projects? And how do we get people to continue to be involved and also uh, open up lines of communications from metadata specialists to the IT folks who are in organization, to the friends of the libraries, to the library dean who are, you know, share a shared mission, but have different lenses and different priorities and how that mission is executed. And they don't often um, talk to one another and have an idea of how how different perspectives bring that mission to bear. So thank you for asking that, Jero. We're really um, considering that and thinking about how we can do that with the community of, pra of practice. Um, in closing, thank you all for being there. I don't want here, I don't want to hold you any longer. If there are partners, activists, artists, community archives, record creators, collectors of all sorts, all organizations or without organizations, who would benefit from um, sub grant support, please reach out to us. We've shared the timeline and we hope to adhere to it, which will mean that we'll have a call for sub grant proposals in early 2023. You can shoot me an email or schedule a call on my Calendly. My uh, email is shanae at dp.la. It's also info at dp.la. Um, if you wanna talk more, Continue to subscribe to DPLA newsletters for updates. And thank you again for joining us and sharing our excitement um, doing about so this much project. Work. She's, got, she's got two email addresses. She's got two email <laughs> accounts, not just one. Some people have two phones. I have two emails. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your